Will many be saved or a few? That question pertains to what is happening at the end of Revelation. And I think I know something about early Genesis. I believe the Holy Spirit has shown me some things about early Genesis. But I, not only do I not know about Revelation, I am suspicious of people who are certain that they know answers about Revelation. And probably you are too. But there is a question about, you know, does it it seem right that God has made all these people and most of them choose the wrong way and then only a few get saved. And, you know, one one answer that's been, it's amazing, and, and due to the grace of God, only that anybody gets saved, that we don't deserve it. But then they, the question from the scoffers is, well, why did he even make us then? And it, it goes back and back and forth. And I... I think I found something here that I want other people to look at and tell me if if I'm missing the boat. I'm not saying, like the things I'm saying on Genesis, I'm convinced they're right, and I'll dig my heels in on that. On this, all I'm doing really is taking what I've been shown about Genesis and applying it to the, the end of Revelation, taking the beginning of Genesis, applying it to the end of Revelation, and seeing what you get when you do that. And it, it could be very different. And so I, I would like to share it with you. And if you agree, fine. If you disagree, fine. It, that, it won't bother me. But I think it does have relevance to these people that they want to accuse God. And the people that want to accuse God are always going to. If they lose one excuse, they'll simply come up with another because that's what they want to do. And the one thing I do know is that because I've seen it in, in people. And it's going to, I can understand completely one part about Revelation I can understand completely is when it says that men will call for the rocks to fall on them and hide them from God. In other words, God now has has given those determined to be unbelievers a little bit of a break. He's not made it absolutely clear who he is. He's allowed them to spend whatever time they have on this earth in denial of him. And the day is going to come when that ends and it's revealed, nope, this is me. This is who I am. I'm here. I'm about to take charge. And they won't repent. They'll say, rocks fall on us and hide us. We don't want to see it. So I'm, I'm that part, there's nothing we can do about those folks. But there are some folks that are confused by the constant stream of accusations that people like that make against the integrity of God. And so... I want to share what I found here. Take it or leave it. Let's let's first let's look at the issue. Does the Bible teach that few will be saved? Uh, one, one scripture that a lot of people quote when they're addressing this issue is is the scripture in the passage that ends: "Many are called, but few are chosen." I do not think that is very applicable to this question because. That is a question of, if you if you look at the broader context of who is invited to the wedding feast. I mean, the parable starts out, the king is holding a wedding feast for his son, and he's like, I'm going to send all these people out. I, hey, come on, the, the feast is ready. Let's do it. And uh, the people that he invited were not worthy of the invitation. And so they beat his messengers, they laughed off his messengers, and he basically said, Okay, well, we'll just get others. Just go get people on the road and and bring them in to the feast. But Jesus ended that by saying someone tried to get in and they were not wearing the wedding clothes provided for them. And the king threw him out into the outer darkness for many are called, but few are chosen. That isn't talking about salvation. It is talking about who is invited to the wedding feast. And if you look in Revelation 19, They speak of the wedding feast before the great white throne of judgment. Indeed, there's that thousand year millennial period in between there and the great white throne of judgment. So uh, things happen in between there. So I don't know that this is talking about salvation. It is, but it is talking about being in, in on the wedding feast. And there is going to be some group of believers 
that are invited to the wedding feast. Maybe it's those who are alive in the last day or those who uh, have, you know, what the text says is the first group of people, the first resurrection are those that refuse the mark of the beast, those that were martyred, those who were killed for their testimony or for, for refusing the beast, that they would be resurrected first and the rest of the dead do not come to life for a thousand years. So one way to take that is that, you know, the whole church does not get resurrected in the first resurrection, but only those that have gone through the great tribulation. Because it said, who are these? These are the ones who have come out of the great tribulation. So, uh, you know, the bottom line is, and, and if the bride is the whole church, then I would ask you, who are the guests at the wedding feast? You know, if, if the whole church is the bride, and Revelation has all these all these mysteries. But the bottom line is, I don't think this scripture is talking about salvation. It's not necessarily, at least, talking about salvation. So you really shouldn't hang your hat doctrinally and say, well, not many are going to be saved because it says many are called, but few are chosen. Many are called to the wedding feast where the son marries the bride. and But, but few are chosen to go to the wedding feast where the son marries the bride. That's a little different than salvation. So that's that's one scripture. So we're, we're being very careful here about, you know, we, we want to have good evidence. If we say not many people are going to be saved, if we're saying that, and, and I, you know, there, some people are so aghast at this idea that not many people will be saved that, they go the other way and they say, well, God isn't going to throw anyone into hell. And that isn't what the Bible teaches either. There are people, there are vessels of wrath even. There are vessels that God in Romans, it says they they were created to show God's mercy to everyone else in contrast to what happens to the vessels of destruction. And Paul's argument is God has a right to do that. He has a right to uh, make an Adolf Hitler designed to go to hell if it will help the saints see God's grace better and as opposed to the way he God treats them versus the way he treats the vessels of wrath so but th but this scripture doesn't really speak very much to the question at hand now there may be a couple more that do so let's look at them all right now here is where Jesus is asked the question directly and it's a long passage if you read the context and i want the context so luke chapter 13 then one said unto him lord are there few that be saved so he's asking the same question i'm asking and many have asked in this video and he said to them strive to enter at the straight gate for many i say to you will seek to enter in and shall not be able so Many will not be able to get in the narrow gate. That rules out the idea that everybody's going to be safe, for example. But it doesn't rule out some other things that I want to discuss after I get through with these passages. All right. When once the master of the house has risen up and is shut to the door, and you begin to stand without and the knock of the door, saying, Lord, Lord, open unto us, and he shall answer and say unto you, I know you not when, where you are. Then he shall begin to say, then shall ye begin to say, we've eaten and drunk in thy presence, and thou hast taught in our streets. But he shall say, I tell you, I know not whence ye are. Depart from me, all ye workers of iniquity. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth when you shall see Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and all the prophets in the kingdom of God, and you yourselves thrust out and they shall come from the east and from the west and from the north and from the south and shall sit down in the kingdom of God and behold there are last which shall be first and there are first which shall be last now I am going to argue that what this is talking about is the way God's people, the Jews, received Jesus. 
It is not even about, because, because a Jewish person is asking Jesus, will many be saved? And he is answering the question in the context of, within God's people, will many be saved? And what he's saying is, you guys are in trouble. You, the, you're wanting to enter, but by the time you figure out the straight gate is the way, will it still be available to you? And you may be a, a, appeal to me and say, but wait a minute, we saw you. You were there. You were in our streets. You were doing this and that. Yeah, but you didn't believe. And he's saying, look, in the kingdom, people are going to come from the east, from the west, the north, and the south. They're going to recline with Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. And but you won't be there. Now, is that saying that very few people of all nations and all time will be saved? No, he's not really answering the question. He's, he's answering the question as it applies to uh, the children of Israel. And it's basically more of a warning saying, don't count on your familiarity with me to be enough. That, oh yeah, he, he is of our tribe or he, he is of our, our blood. And Jesus is saying that that familiarity itself, that's not going to save you. It's going, I will save many people, but beware. You are closest to me on earth, but you could be farthest from me in the next life because many of the last shall be first and first last. So he was asked a question, but a certain question that we might think is worldwide will everybody be saved but he was i think he was answering it in the context of his people so e even that one uh, is we cannot say the bible says that most people will go to hell just based on this verse either this is matthew 7 enter ye at the straight gate for wide is the gate and broad is the way that leads to destruction and many there be who go in thereat because straight is the gate and narrow is the way which leads unto life and few there be that find it now that is the in my mind i think it's connected to that other conversation that they just took a snippet it doesn't have the same broader context but that in my mind is the one that would be most indicative of well gee those who are saved are going to be a few and uh, I mean, those who think well gee evolution survival of the fittest you know only the only the few survive and the many perish that's it's kind of what nature does basically and they, they could make that argument but i don't know that this fully answers the question either because what it's saying is it's about discovery okay Jesus isn't saying outright, and you'll see what I mean by this distinction as I go on, because you might think, well, what's the difference? There is a difference. I will explain the difference in a little bit. But right now, the difference between uh, finding or, or entering the straight gate, and f or finding the straight gate, I should say, finding it, and entering the broad way that leads to destruction there's a difference between that and you getting in the straight gate versus not only just finding the, the broad way that leads to destruction but going ahead and getting destroyed okay so because he doesn't he's not speaking of their end fate he's saying most people are going to go the broad path that leads to destruction a few people are going to find the straight gate all right, and and you would assume that means most people will not be saved, and that's the assumption I've had until I started applying the Christ-centered model for early Genesis and looking at the end of Revelation through that. And I'll explain what I mean as I go on. The way Revelation is, the last chapters of Revelation are spelled out. The end comes in stages, and it's it's kind of weird. And without the Christ-centered model, you, you always you might wonder why is God doing it this way? You know, he he slays the Antichrist, the beast. They get thrown into the lake of fire. But but not everybody is raised from the dead, and not everybody is judged. First, you have this 
thousand year period. You have the the marriage supper of the son, and you you have that in chapter nineteen. But not everybody is raised from the dead. Only those that were martyred against the mark of the beast and against the uh, you know the, the false prophet, and they get for the testimony of Jesus. Those people are resurrected. It seems like it's just the group at the end before God establishes order, defeats the armies of this world, and sets up. And it says that basically they, the resurrected people, like Christ, will rule the nations with a rod of iron. So it's very confusing. Only after the thousand-year period are ended is Satan released. He deceives the nations. Then they come against God's people, but God destroys them quickly. And it, it, then, then you have you know the real end of things. What is what is why have this thousand year period? What is up with that? Why have uh, and then and then you have everybody resurrected, and then you have people that are. It's very strange. In chapter twenty, they are judged according to their works, which of course none of us will make it if you're judged according to our works. But it doesn't say they're. It says they're judged according to their works, but their end isn't determined by their works. Rather, there's a second book, the Lamb's Book of Life. And what matters is whether your name is written in the Lamb's Book of Life or not. If you are, you're in. If you're not, you're out. Now, I assume when you are judged by your works, your works are found to be inadequate. And when you are judged according to the whether your name is in the Lamb's Book of Life, well, whew, you, you're relieved because if you were judged by your works, you wouldn't make it. So that's a weird process. It's kind of a different process. It's not like, okay, why have the two endings? Why have the thousand years? Why have this uh, extra period and then everybody is judged? And why judge them? It's almost like they're being evaluated on their works criteria and then they're Fate is determined by whether they're in the Lamb's Book of Life. And that's a distinction. So let's go a little further in that. All right. In, in chapter 19, those you, you have the people that were resurrected. They rule the nations with a rod of iron. Those nations apparently are made of the people that are not killed after God kills all the armies that had come uh against him in chapter 19 then at the end of the thousand years satan is let loose he deceives the nations again and god ends that one and then they have this uh, great white throne of judgment and then chapter 21 the city of jerusalem comes down from heaven it's it's like the bride of christ has come down and the city is called the bride of Christ, which everywhere else in Scripture is the church. You know, even like in chapter 19, it's the, the church seems to be the saints. And then the bride comes down, and there are still nations. It's not like everybody's in the city of Jerusalem. There's still the, the, it's the nations of the saved. It's the nations that walk in the light of what God says they bring their glory into Jerusalem, but, but who are the nations of the saved? Isn't if New Jerusalem is the bride of Christ, which is the church, then who are these other people? And that confused me, you know, for a long time, because the bride has always been referred to as the church everywhere else in Scripture. Here it's Jerusalem, and I do wonder if. Uh, you know the the bride of Christ. I always thought to be all believers of all time, and I still do. Now maybe it could be some special group of believers, like maybe these people that got resurrected in, in the tribulation and, and ruled a thousand years. Maybe they had some kind of special role, and that. The nations are all us other regular Christians. Uh, you know that certain cults have teachings. There's, there's one cult that has a teaching that 
Only 144,000 are saved, and the rest of us live in, in paradise forever on earth. And I remember that one, too. But what I want to do next is I want to show you what the Christ-centered model says about early Genesis and then compare that to what we these mysteries that we're examining in Revelation and see if we can make the connection. So if you've been following my channel, you know that in the Christ-centered model, Adam is a figure of Christ. He isn't the father of the human race. He wasn't the first man. He was the first man who stood in for all men. And Christ is the last man who stood in for all men. There were already people here when God formed Adam and Eve to bring humanity from innocence to accountability. So God's original plan, and here's where I'm, I'm describing how the Christ-centered model works, and then we'll compare that to what's happening in Revelation. I think you'll see a fantastic correlation. And what it could mean is, is fantastic as far as the great mercy of God goes and how his wisdom is so above our ways and just when we think gee I don't know about that and he, he manages to amaze us with his goodness so the original plan this life was always the test the, the folks that say you know that the creation was made deathless and sinless that's not what it says that's not in the account uh, the world this life was always meant to be the test that's why God subjected creation to futility it wasn't after Adam and Eve fell. He subjected it to creation before Adam and Eve were ever there. And I'm not going to prove all that here tonight. It, it's in my book. But you still have the situation where God's like, okay, I've created mankind. I've given them dominion to complete my work. And now I've got to bring them to innocence and account to accountability. I'm going to start with a couple that has privilege and there's the population in the garden, Adam and Eve, my intermediary. He's going to be a light to the rest of them and bring them to me. And the first Adam, of course, failed to do that. The second Adam did. And, of course, you know God knows these things in advance. But because the first Adam chose what he chose, he chose self over God, uh, that the pain in childbirth would be greatly multiplied. And, and that has to do with bringing forth the man-child that rules the nations with the rod of iron. That's the folks in uh, the corporate body of Christ in Revelation 19, not necessarily something about, you know, every woman now, now pregnancy hurts more. But here you have this group in the garden this pair in the garden and they, they would have a family and multiply and they would grow but they would they would show the rest of the world how to do it the nations outside the garden see would over time become affected by learning in the garden and that didn't work out because of adam's sin but god's plan is not going to be thwarted okay and the idea was for this life was for us to fit ourselves for eternity by choosing God over self. And this world was never meant to be eternal. We were never meant to physically live in the bodies we have now. I mean, it says it in 1 Corinthians, flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. And then it goes on to say, we're going to have bodies that are better, that are not perishable. So then in heaven, you have the eternal kingdom. Okay, Maybe once God had found all the souls that he wanted that, that chose fellowship with him. He calls the thing to an end and that's where it ends with uh, everybody participating in the tree of life. So this to me fits very nicely with the uh, thousand year reign because the idea is that they would basically do what Adam and Eve and their prodigy would have done. In other words, it would still get done. There would be a thousand-year period where uh, there would be God's people and they would rule over the nations and they would not perhaps harshly but 
showing God's ways. And, and this would be, you know, Isaiah 65 and other places talk about uh, when, when God, there'll be a time when uh, if someone dies at age 100, they'll say, oh, he, he's a sinner. He just, he just died too young. And, and I think that's the millennial period where uh, this insanity of man trying to rule man according to man's own way is put to an end. We start living according to God's way. And there's an era of peace and prosperity. And part of that is that there's going to be, you know, we're going to start return to having lifespans like only a few had in the scriptures. That only the, only the patriarchs who walked with the Lord and their descendants had those long lifespans. Not, not everybody had them. So then that period is going to come to a close. The, the Satan is not going to be able to undermine it from the start like he did in early Genesis. He's going to be bound for a thousand years. Only then is he loosed to lie to all the people who want to be lied to. So to me, that fits with the Christ-centered model. What he's doing in Genesis 19 is very similar to what the original plan was back in early Genesis. Okay, but it gets better. Because of Adam's choice, a lot of people have made other choices. You know, every, every decision, every choice is, a, is made in a context. For example, you might have people that they say, well, they've never heard the name of Jesus. And we've, we've sometimes wondered, what happens? To, what about those who've never had heard the name of Jesus or had no chance for the gospel? And people have given various answers about that. Or, or what if someone... You know, many people come in the name of the Lord, but they are doing it falsely. And there's, there's abuse in the church. And some people, maybe, they never could reconcile who Jesus really was with who the people that came in his name were. So they would have chosen differently if, starting from Adam, God's people had done what God wanted, but they didn't. They didn't. There was a lot of pain in this world, a lot of suffering in this world. It stems from man refusing to, to submit to God. But because of that, the echoes of that uh, cause even more people to not submit to God because they, they, they feel the pain, they feel the hurt. So, you know, the question is, by the unbelievers, why would God create a world where 90% of the people are doomed to hell. And if he knew, if he's all knowing, he knows what choice they would make. So when he created them, he knew that. And, you know, again, I have argued and I buy Paul's argument that God has the right to do that. And that if there's, he creates a vessel of wrath, to display his grace better to his vessels of mercy, then it's it's still right. It's still right that it, it's worth it. That vessel of wrath is what it wants to be. But the idea that, that, that okay, what, 90% of the world's population, the many versus the few, I want you to think about this. If God knows who would choose him before he ever creates them. He also knows who would have chosen him if Adam had not taken the fruit. If the world, if his plan, original plan had gone as he wanted it to go, then those people that they never really had a fair chance to see God's way, or they were hurt or abused by someone in the church, they, God would know that. God would know this person would have chosen me if their circumstances were different. And some, he may not be willing to do the circumstances for. Okay? Because some, that they wouldn't choose him unless he made them God. He isn't going to do that. Okay? But there are other people that, you know, if they could only see and, and really understand 
God's grace and God's mercy and who, God's character, these worth loving, he's worth worshiping, they would. But they couldn't see it because of the chaos caused by the serpent and Adam's sin and all the changes that have happened since then. And what, what I'm suggesting is the bride is the church, like has often been the case that, you know, the standard Christian theology, well, the bride is the church. New Jerusalem comes down, she's the bride, well, then that's the church. The nations of the saved are all those people that God knows would have chosen right if Adam had not done what he did and all of the agony that followed. He knows, and he saves them anyway. They are the they are not the bride. They didn't in their lifetime. They did not choose Jesus, but they would have if Adam hadn't fallen. If and so God's plan will not be changed one bit. What He intended will not be changed one bit. He intended for this life to be the test. He intended for uh, humanity to go through life and, and the garden to be a light and. The other nations see how that is. God is to be worshipped and follow along with that. And so heaven gets stocked with more and more souls until the end. And that is what's going to happen. In other words, they will all be judged when it says the books were opened. And they were, people were judged by their deeds. And they, when they're judged by their deeds, they're all going to be judged unworthy. I, am, I would be too. But then there's another book. The Lamb's Book of Life. And it's opened up and it's like, you know what? You're going to live. And those who saw my mercy and saw who I was in the, in the life that they lived, they're, gonna, they're the bride. They're the holy city. They're the city of God. But you guys, you didn't see it, but you would have seen it. You would have been willing if only you had been given a better world. I'm, you're going to be the nations of the saved. You'll be saved and you'll bring glory into God's holy city. Even if you're, you're not that city, you're the nations outside. So is this right? What does this mean? Does this mean it, I would think that it may be the other way around. Instead of why would God, why would a just God create a human race where 90% of them are going to hell and only 10% are going to heaven? Maybe it's the other way around. Maybe he's going to save 90% and 10% are going to hell. I don't know that. You know, I don't know. I, I, I know that you don't get to heaven except through Jesus. I do know that. I do know that there's only one way. He is the way. I know that men die once and after that, the judgment. So I'm not saying re this is not exactly reincarnation. This is resurrection. They are judged. But because of what Jesus did, their name was in the Lamb's Book of Life. Now, does this mean, okay, gee, I can just go ahead and, and live how I want and uh, I, I'll just, you know, I'll, I'll get lucky and I'll, I'll wind up in the uh, nations of the saved anyway? No, I, I would say that we're probably getting near the end here, folks. I don't know that, uh, but we have much more knowledge of God, if you want it, than, than prior generations. Uh, I'd say that there are a lot of people in a lot of generations that have had, you know, some kind of excuse, but we, we're run out. We've run out of excuses, folks. It's time to consider what you were made for, if you're made for anything at all, and who made you, and what he says the point of your existence is. You know, it, it's. It's time to admit that your ways are not the best ways. You're, you're not even your own best boss. He knows what's good for you more than you do. So oh, I, I say it not so that people say, well, okay, then I, don't, then I really don't have to, to say yes to Jesus in this life because I could still get saved anyway. Yeah, but you could also get 
thrown to hell anyway. And we don't know that I'm right about this. I don't know that I'm right about this. I'm saying that I see nothing in the text that rules this out. And so, therefore, these people that, that say, well, gee, I could have come up with a better plan than making humans, and when I know in advance 90% of them won't become Christians and will go to hell. Okay, well, 90% of them have not become Christians, but we don't know that 90% of them are going to hell. I'm not one of these people that says everyone is saved. I'm not one of these people that say that some other religion will get you there. I'm just saying when I look at and see what early Genesis says and I compare that and see what God was trying to do in early Genesis, then I look at what happens at the end of Revelation. His purpose would be accomplished if what I'm describing happened. It would fit the pattern, and his purpose would have been accomplished as if Adam had never taken the fruit. That would be how it ended, as if Adam had never taken the fruit. It would be a people that come into the, the garden, which would over time turn into a city as uh, you know, Adam's children received pe they received people from the outside. They married people from the outside. They grew into a city, and the nations would be saved and bring their glory into the garden, which would become a city. Same thing would happen. It, it, after, after all the agony, all the pain, all the suffering of us trying to do things our own way, it ended up exactly like God wanted it to in his original plan. That that's my hypothesis. Again, I'm I'm not married to this one. You know, go ahead and shoot holes in it in the comment section or what have you. Uh, but I, I want for everyone to see what's possible, and I want those who are concerned about the issue of, gee, how, most people aren't saved. Would God create a human race and then send most of them to hell? If He does, it's just. But just I don't know that it's going to be that. But whatever He does. It's going to be just, and from what I'm seeing, it could be the scenario I'm describing, in which case it's both just and glorious. Thank you for listening, and may God.